everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, a podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, game masters, and enthusiasts like Josh and myself. I am Dan. I am Josh. There we go. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things quizzical and geographical. We have a small little bit of email to get to first, and after that, we'll touch upon uh, what are the geographical oddities of Earth Dawn, Death's Sea. So if you have any questions for us, please let us know at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Anything we need to announce before we get right into the emails, Josh? Only if I, I had kind of put this in the show notes and mentioned it in the past, the recorded streams from FreedoniaCon are most of them uploaded to the FASA Games YouTube channel. Yeah. So if you missed any of those and you want to go check them out, that is where you can find them. Luckily, uh, our podcast, episode 60, which was live, only has about three or four views, last I checked. So people would rather hear us than see us, which is all good for me, <laughs> since I have the face for radio. <laughs> Had to be said. So let's get right to the emails. We got four rather long, lengthy Lesson 201 emails we can get to instead of uh, 101 emails. So this is from Riley. You mentioned in the podcast wondering how Game Masters give players access to new spells beyond the standard training value. So I figured I would share my standard rules. When a player said they wanted new spells, I would make them give me a list of up to five spells, and then they'd make a standard charisma check to find a spellcaster potentially willing to sell difficulty modified by the location and the connections it might have had in the area, as well as the circle of the spell. If they just succeeded, I would give them a teacher and then look over the spell list to see if the ones they wanted fit a theme. If so, any of those that master would have, and anything outside of that, I would roll randomly to see if the spellcaster happened to have it. On a d6, he'd roll a 5 or 6 and say yes. Everything else was a no, I assume. I think if we were looking at it now, with a dramatically reduced spell list from the old days, I would probably say they make a charisma or half magic test, and for every success they can find one spell that they want with the difficulty set tied to the highest circle of the spell. I would also just occasionally give out spell books. Anytime they fought an NPC that was a caster, they would have an opportunity to find their spell book. Sometimes it'd be obvious, sometimes it'd be hidden, and require some checks. And usually, in those cases, I would give them whatever spells they had in their, in their matrices, and then three to six more spells that fit their general caster theme. Thoughts, Josh? Uh, yeah, that's all sounds pretty good. Generally speaking... There's no real need long term, I think, to prevent spellcasters from getting their spells because that's mm -hmm. what spellcasters do. But <laughs> I think a charisma or half magic check to see what they find is a good idea. Yeah, I like the methodology, at least as far as, you know, not a whole bunch at one time or uh, just a couple, couple, three here doled out every once in a while. Yeah. The issue with the limited spell lists in fourth edition certainly does make it a little bit tougher, makes it feel a little bit stranger to restrict access to spells. Like they're more scarce or harder to come by? No, the other, like, if there are only six spells of a given circle it yeah. feels not great to prevent characters from getting them mm -hmm. and i think a lot of that will depend on the pacing of what kind of rewards you're giving out to the other characters and things like that fair let me ask you a question because i don't think it's been been dis discussed real quick i want to vary off of riley's email how many spells is virag walking around with total virag's got a lot of spells we we actually just I figured I asked the question. Um let's see. Virag has a total of forty four spells. Okay. And she so is she is well she, she is solidly into seventh circle at this point. Okay. So we're talking roughly six, seven spells per circle. Right, but those are pretty heavily weighted towards circle one and two. I think I've got all or very nearly all of the circle one and two spells got a bunch of the circle three spells do not have as many of the higher circles largely because of the moments when i had able to learn them uh, i typically mm -hmm. did not have the legend or money coin resources yeah. of some sort to pick up everything that i wanted gotcha 
But yes, so Virag, no, I, uh, <laughs> as is traditional, Virag has quite a lot of spells. And there's only one custom spell in all of that. And that's Fair. the spell that Cliff okay. made that was the spell that would open Palanthrax's tower. Tower. The siphon, the yeah. Palanthrax's siphon spell. That's the only custom spell. Mm -hmm. Everything else out of the books is out of the, the player's guide. Okay. You know, looking at the spell list and the number of spells that I have available, and even with a total mm -hmm. of six matrices, once I factor in my thread item and uh, another enhanced, uh, another rum spell matrix item that I have. Yeah. I don't feel like I am short on spells, which is part of the reason why, <laughs> you know, the people going, oh, there aren't enough spells in the books. Certainly the higher circle stuff, I can maybe understand a little bit of that, but I don't feel okay. like I'm short of spells. Gotcha. Okay. No, I, I, I wanted a gauge. I wanted a, a, a character to compare with for all the players out there so that they can say, okay, well, Virag is, like I said, well into seventh circle, 44 spells, only one's custom. That's fine. That's, well, that's an offshoot. So let's go down to 43 or 42. That's six per circle. Virag has spent about a total of about 140,000 legend points right now. Yeah. And actually is not that far into seventh circle, is qualified for seventh circle, but has not gotten to the, we have not had enough downtime recently to- Circle up. To no to start bringing up mm. ranks. I've only got one talent currently at rank eight. Okay, so I've only actually Virag has only just started into Circle Seven. Fair, but you're there. But I am there. That's okay. I like I said, I, I've got a ways to go to eighth. I've got to bring up some of my secondary. I've got to bring up Banish. I think a little bit. <laughs> anyway, that's okay. No, fine. I want a nice little detour because I have not played a spellcaster in years. And what I'm playing right now in fourth, fourth edition is a scout. So I don't have any spellcasting to fall back on. So I wanted to bring up Virag <clears throat> because A, anybody can listen to those podcasts and figure and follow along with Virag. And B, now that they can do that, I wanted to point out how many spells you actually have that you can put into a matrix at any time. Yep. So not bad. So thank you, Riley, for the interesting conversation and in the beginning of our podcast today. I appreciate that. So on to Ted, who has a question about a specific spell, True Ephemeral Bolt. So hi, Dan and Josh. I have a question regarding the True Ephemeral Bolt. The debuff is described as minus two to the target's next sensing test. Given that sensing illusions is a secondary effect to the normal use to, to a test, does the normal test suffer the minus two step effect if it is interacting in a way that could sense an illusion. He gives an example while well, Josh ponders this. For instance, would a melee attacker who has been hit by a true ephemeral bolt suffer a, an additional minus two steps to land a melee attack against a target under monstrous mantle where a high enough total might sense the illusion? Or is this one of the rare instances where the unmodified step is rolled and a, modified apply, a modifier applied to that? In this case, a melee weapons test for a result to hit against a physical defense and minus two is taken from the result to compare against sensing difficulty? My head's already hurting in this one. Uh, this has been a source of confusion since I played in first edition. <laughs> so thanks for the clar any clarification we can get them. Yeah. Hang on, Ted. Let's go through this one step at a time now. So, so winding it all back. Yeah. <laughs> I understand what he's getting at. A character who is under the effects of the monstrous mantle spell yes. gets a plus two to close combat attack and damage tests, as well as a plus two to their physical defense. Cool. A target that attacks them with melee weapons. True ephemeral bolt. Well, no, oh, no, no. Sorry, with melee we're going to, oh, we're yeah. going to set aside true ephemeral bolt for right now. <clears throat> I'm going to lay out the situation of his example to talk, yes. to lead into what his situation is. Fair. Okay. I had to grab something that I wanted to look at as a specific reference. Okay. So monstrous cool. mantle plus two physical defense. Mm -hmm. plus two to close combat attack and damage if someone is attacking a character who is affected by the monstrous mantle spell with a mm -hmm. close combat attack monstrous mantle is a first circle spell and so has a sensing difficulty of 16 what that means is that normally when they attack someone who is under the effects of monstrous mantle if mm -hmm. they roll a 16 or better on their attack test because basically that yes. that attack is interacting with the illusion of the character being all hulked up and whatnot if they roll a 16 yes. or better on their attack test, they sense that it is an illusion that is affecting the character and it goes away. They can kind of see through it. Well, it basically eliminates the spell. Fair. 
So let's say that, for example, they are attacking, they're rolling a step 10 on their attack test. If they roll a 16 or better, then they sense that it's an illusion and it, the character loses the physical defense bonus and so forth. Like like any illusion, once it is sensed, it is no longer in yes. effect in, in the mm-hmm. way that is described in the books. The situation that Ted is describing is saying, okay, now let's say the attacker got hit by a true ephemeral bolt successfully. They are supposed to suffer a minus two penalty to their next sensing test. So when they are rolling to attack that character, when they are making their melee weapons attack to attack the character with monstrous mantle, Mm -hmm. do they suffer the minus two penalty on that roll? And so instead of rolling step 10, they roll step eight with the target number still being a 16 to sense it. But what that does is that it makes the it makes it harder for them to hit the target which is already mm-hmm. being factored in by the fact that the target gets a plus two to their physical defense. Yes. Or should they roll their normal step mm-hmm. 10 and only determine if they sense it by subtracting two from the result of that roll? The roll. So that effectively gotcha. they would need to roll an 18 or better because you subtract the two to make it 16. Flip or, or flip it around, increase mm-hmm. the, the target number to an 18 for the ability to sense yes. it. That basically it doesn't mm-hmm. affect the the attacker's ability to actually make the attack. It just makes it a little gotcha. bit harder for them to sense the fact that it is an illusion. Okay. I cannot recall off the top of my head whether there has been official errata or clarification issued on this. I am inclined to handle it as the latter, that it does not actually affect the step that they roll for exactly. the attack. It just means Mm -hmm. that they're going to need an effectively higher result in order to to sense the target. This is something that in the course of development of the first edition illusionist spells and having some spells that play around with sensing tests and and that sort of thing. Yeah. That I don't think all of the consequences completely fully thinking through of what that minus two penalty meant in that regard – so I would be inclined and generally would advise people to don't change the step. And also in part because if you flip the situation around where you've got an mm-hmm. enemy that has monstrous mantle or some other kind of illusion on them. Yeah. And it's a player character that has been hit by a true ephemeral bolt. If you tell them that they need to reduce their step by two, then they're going to know that there are illusions in play potentially. Fair. Mm hmm. I think if I were to go back at this point, I would probably look at handling that differently. Okay, fair. Maybe look at handling it similarly to False Sight, I think is the name of the illusionist talent that allows Mm -hmm. them to boost the the sensing difficulty of their illusions. You might handle that in a similar way in terms of how the mechanics work. I hope my... Talking through the problem <laughs> clarified it not only for you, but for anyone else that might have been listening and not quite following what was going on. I think so. And that cause... I answered the question with the way that I would handle it. No, I think you did well because it's, uh, to your point, how much should the game master give away that there are illusions in play? So it's easier just for them to modify the target needed to sense it rather than tip their hand and let the players know that there are illusions going on. So they have to reduce their, their, their dice rolls. So I like the solution which is just it's not quite as bad in fourth edition where we got rid of the funky oh i want to disbelieve and roll a test kind of thing yeah wanting to disbelieve an illusion takes place in very specific circumstances and is kind of an all or nothing yes. deal fair but it's still the interactions with illusions can get a little bit weird that's okay illusions always make things a little bit weird <laughs> as they should. they just That's the point. So on to a rather long email from Lee, who says we didn't have to read this out loud. I just think it's fun to do so because it might uh, spurn anybody else's imagination to their campaign as well. So hi, Dan and Josh. Interesting discussions. Thank you both for your continued efforts in disseminating the love. You don't need to read this out, but it's more of an ideas for future broadcasts thing. His ideas on passions. Looking at my local mythology, we have two interesting characters, Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham. There were several aspects to both. Robin could be viewed as an archer, a swordmaster, or a thief. The idealized legend has him portrayed as a champion of justice who rebelled against tyranny and oppression. I think he could be applied to three passions, Locost, Minbruge, and Thistonius. 
The sheriff had two roles, tax collector, and who loves them, and feudal lord. The sheriff obviously is viewed as the tyrant, extorting unfair taxes on the commons, but also uses cruel punishments to enforce his will through fear. Now, Lee doesn't say that probably uh, would be a follower of Corollas, because he doesn't mention a passion for the sheriff at all. Um, maybe? Maybe? It's a guess? Only because he brought up the tax collector part. Right. And the feudal lord for trading at best, but I can't yeah, think of... Yeah, the, the sheriff, I'm not quite sure exactly what he's... Because as you said, he doesn't mention passions there on yeah. the, the second one. But as a as a tyrant extorting unfair taxes, cruel punishments, I think he might be potentially leaning towards... Mad passion. A Ragok kind of situation. Yeah. Where, where mm-hmm. we had talked about Ragok being, you know, Rashomon and how you could look at some of maybe Rashomon's ideals twisted for Ragok. Yes. There could also be, so, we haven't talked about Dis, but there could also be a little bit of Dis in there. Because mm-hmm. there's a very sort of like bureaucratic drudgery that can sort of go there. Yes. But yeah, I, I think potentially if you wanted to go with that kind of situation, um, Ragok, uh, I think, ties closer to the sheriff in terms of his role in the typical Robin Hood mythos, which is to say yeah. that he's sort of a, an antagonist villain type. And in, in that case, you would probably look at Robin being probably more of a min Bruges in terms of justice, in terms of going mm-hmm. to counteract the corrupted social order that the sheriff is kind of representing in that regard. Yeah. But Locust is also, I think, in some ways, a very appropriate, although when we talk about Locust, we'll get into some aspects of that, I think. Yeah, yeah. A little ways down the road. So those are Lee's first half of his email about the possible uh, mythology and passion discussion. On to his ideas about spells. This bit really is just for the internal information amongst the team. So, mostly to Josh and his collaborators. I'm really enjoying playing a Nethermancer in my current 4th edition campaign. We've been joined by two new to Earth Dawn players, and I'm constantly <laughs> reminding them Nethermancers aren't like D&D necromancers. Yes. The removal of undead creation and control spells from the Nethermancer toolkit in 4th edition, I feel, is a step in the proper direction. I know Morgan is currently working on a further core magic supplement, but I just wanted him to know that the distinction between PC Adept, Horror, and Mad Passion Quester is clearly defined as only two of those can currently reanimate corpses. I like that the Nethermancer cannot. Anywho, rambling over and looking forward to the next podcast. Lee. Yeah. Thoughts? I think that's cool. Yeah. I appreciate that. uh, Like him, I I like that there's not a lot of overlap, so there's a very clear distinction about, well, I'm fighting this guy. He can do this thing. Clearly, not another Mancer, or clearly uh, a quester of a mad passion. So that kind of narrows that down. Nether Mancers get spells that deal with undead. Mm-hmm. And their half magic allows them to to interact and, and know things about undead pretty easily. Yeah, yeah. But yes, the fact that another mancer, at least as of right now, and I don't know exactly what Morgan is working on as far as the spells, but there may be some spells yeah. that bring back the ability for the nether mancer to possibly do some stuff with regards to undead beyond dust to dust and life circle of one and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think, you know, when you get into villain nethermancers, the ability to create or control undead is something that some people expect. Yeah. I am not sure of exactly where Morgan is going with some of that, but yeah. But that's okay. I agree with Lee's point that the spell selection in the player's guide does not give the impression of Nethermancers being the stereotypical necromancer raising the dead kind of thing. Fair. I'm okay with that. It deals a lot more with ally spirits because you've got the Mm -hmm. aspect spells, you've got some summon related stuff, you've got some spells that deal with horrors and horror constructs like dust to dust and life circle of one. But Mm -hmm. Those are to combat those things, not to make them your own. Fair. Thank you, Lee. We looked, uh, <clears throat> look forward to hearing more from you because that was an interesting topic of discussion you brought up. We like both of those. Uh, so please give us more. On to Brian. 
Hi there. I was listening to your most recent To Me podcast about acquiring spells and had a thought. Well, good. We like people thinking. While there won't, and in my opinion, shouldn't be rules for creating spells in 4th edition, are there any guidelines of what a group sh should be particularly careful about introducing in terms of spells? As for one example, I can't recall if Morgan explicitly said that you should never allow hard crowd control spells that can be cast every turn. He indicated that there was a reason there are two threads or more typically, but that would be something to watch out for. Are there any others you could think of? Note, I define hard crowd control as something that denies actions in, term, in some form. Preventing someone from moving is hard crowd control. Slowing them down or creating a damaging area or obstacle in between them and where they want, might want to go is soft crowd control. Anyway, it seems unlikely that this is the only pitfall that inexperienced designers, i.e. homebrewing game masters or players, might fall into that more experienced designers would know to avoid. And I was wondering if you could make any other specific recommendations about what to avoid. Of course, if you feel like giving some advice on what you should do as well, I'm all ears. But that seems like an almost infinite list of entirely situational stuff to me. Thanks, Brian. So, uh, anything else you can think of or something to watch out for uh, about hard crowd control spells that can be cast every turn? Well, I want to talk about hard crowd control a little bit first. Fair. Because that messes around with action economy a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you can lock down a target so that they can't take any actions. Yeah. Except to possibly try and throw off the effect. And that is something that a lot of the hard crowd control do allow that possibility, usually a willpower test yeah. of some sort. Although there are some other variations. But if you can lock a target down, remove them as a hazard in a mm -hmm. combat situation, that can be a dramatic shift in terms of the balance of power simply because of action economy. And that goes both ways. Part of the reason is that if we have spells that do hard crowd control on enemies, in theory, that stuff should also be available for enemies to use on player characters. And it's never yes. really that much fun for those tables to be turned, for a character <laughs> to be completely locked down and unable to act yes. while the other folks continue to to have free reign mm -hmm. so there are two aspects of that one is allowing resistance tests each time to throw off the effect the other aspect of that is that hard crowd control spells generally should require the caster to maintain concentration so that you're trading action for action if you're going to deny yeah. somebody their action you need to spend your action to do so yes because if you are able to cast a lockdown spell, hard crowd control every round without needing to sacrifice your action to maintain that, it does not mm -hmm. take that much effort overall to lock down, you know, an enemy force. And it kind of changes how battles work. At that point, you're looking at who can get off their crowd control spells more quickly to basically lock down the target. <laughs> also, as an added step to that, you really want to be careful with crowd control spells that lock down multiple targets because that gets the efficiency even higher. Yeah. Generally speaking, it's not so much effects that you want to avoid crowd control. I think being the, the biggest one, you want to be a little bit careful with spells that deal damage only in the sense that you want to balance those while keeping in mind will force which is a damage adder in much the same way that you see with crushing blow and, and melee damage boosters from close combat types. So yeah. you want to make sure that when you're looking at the damage that you do with spells, particularly lower circle spells of how mm -hmm. that's going to change when will force becomes available because will force is going to immediately spike the, uh, the capability of those damage spells to come out. You. Mm -hmm. So you want to be a little bit careful with that. And if you're going to have any kind of secondary effects that go along with those with damage, like if you look at kind of the standard circle one zero thread spells that each of the disciplines get, if there's going to be a secondary effect that goes along with it, you want to scale back the damage a little bit as kind of a counteraction. The number of threads you need to keep in mind because a one thread spell 
once you get into journeyman circles, becomes a spell that can be cast every round. Mm -hmm. And so two or more threads, that basically two thread minimum means that it can at best be cast every other round. Yeah. And you maybe want to keep that in mind when you're looking at the effects that it can do is how frequently it can be brought to bear. Generally speaking, understanding that additional successes <clears throat> allow multiple threads to be woven. So the difference between a, a two thread and a three thread spell is not actually that huge in terms of caster action economy. I'm sure Morgan would have a lot more coherent thoughts on that. I also was just going to think that, you know, watch, watch all this discussion about uh, hard crowd control and soft crowd control, and Morgan's going to come up with a new spell out of the new book called Crowd Control. I'm just saying he's going to blow this whole thing wide open and make this entire discussion moot. <laughs> the other thing that you want to That's keep in thought. mind, because magicians are really effective at area effect stuff. That as a discipline, is that that's something that they can do more mm -hmm. effectively? And that is also something that you need to keep in mind as far as scaling goes. If you're going to have a spell or effect that is area effect that targets multiple people, you maybe want to be careful about how much it can output, only because a blizzard sphere, which can affect mm -hmm. multiple targets, you want to be careful how that shapes out in terms of how much damage a warrior of fifth circle mm -hmm. or whatever could put out in terms of their actions and how many opponents they could deal with. So it's, it's just a matter of, of looking at those sorts of things and, and within the context of how does this shape up in comparison to what other disciplines can do. That was one of the things that kind of could have been seen as an issue with earlier editions and the spells that were available is that mm -hmm. when the higher circle area effect spells became available to magicians and why magicians could be seen to be a little bit overpowered is that they could potentially, because of an area effect spell, put out more damage on multiple targets at once than even a multiple attack capable swordmaster or warrior would be able to do at the same circle. So there are some potential issues there. But yeah, Crowd control, debuffs, all that sort of thing. Those are the kinds of effects that are the bread and butter um, area effect yeah. stuff is really cool for magicians because that's an area that most disciplines can't really get into particularly well. Exactly. And it's, it's from a designer standpoint, like you said, it's just finding the right balance in action economy plus how many people you can actually affect and so forth. So you got to, got to make them work for it. Yeah. Looking at the numbers as well and understanding that different players and different tables have different feelings on balance. Mm -hmm. And Morgan and I sometimes joke with each other. If we've got people who are saying this is awesome and other people who are saying it sucks, we're probably in the right place. <laughs> yes. Yes. Can't please everybody all the time. So cool. Uh, thank you everyone for the, Interesting emails. It led to some in-depth discussion for the last half hour or so. Uh, appreciate all of them. So if you have your own questions for us on anything we've ever talked about or something you want us to talk about, please feel free to email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Why I went into iambic pentameter right then, I have no idea, uh, but that happens. So otherwise, uh, next up, we're going to get into something geographical because we have just a little bit of time left. And I figured this was nice to do because... It is a unique aspect in Earth Dawn that I don't come across in a lot of other places, which is, oh, look, you can go to active lava pits and Death Sea is not just molten lava. There's a story behind it as well. There's a wonderful legend about death being imprisoned under Death Sea. Yes. So it's uh, the passions actually got together and Garlen had this whole thing where she was sad that because uh, the universe loves life above all, she said, because life holds the joy and wonder that give the universe meaning. We must protect life or all will sink in despair. So she had the idea that they needed to solve death. And Jaspri suggested his imprisonment. Yeah. So really, we can start kind of in the south and work our way northward uh, of the Death Sea. Most of the Death Sea is actually ringed with black stone hills. And the cliffs right around the actual edge here are 50 to 100 yards high. So they're pretty freaking steep. And this is like a large bowl, essentially, keeping all of the lava in there. 
Um, so what I find interesting about the whole story about Jasper suggested imprisoning death, and they did so, the Passions used blood magic and ritual blood magic to bind death there, as the legend goes. And then the sea erupted into molten rock. Any comments about the the story so far? Is it well, a wonderful the, legend? Or? That's the story. That's the story. <laughs> it's a heck of a story. Yeah. I don't know how much people want to actually include that when they when they uh, send their their uh, adventuring group or their party down anywhere near Death Sea. Yeah. There is a cult that is dedicated to the idea that if enough name giver blood is spilled mm -hmm. on the lands of Barsave, that it will free death. The keys of death is what they're called. Yes. And they're basically a group of assassins and sinister cultists, uh, great bad guys to serve as enemies. Story foil. <laughs> yeah, or story foil, something like that. <laughs> the nature of Death Sea and whether the story of it is true or not is up for debate. You know, the idea of the passions using blood magic or, or ritual blood magic seems a little bit strange in terms of what we know about the passions and the way yeah. that they are able to act and so forth. But like many sort of myths and tales, it is something that is that was perhaps created as a way of explaining why there is a massive sea of molten rock and elemental fire in the yeah. southwestern corner of the province. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the truth of it, Death's Sea <laughs> is there. <laughs> Uh, there's no denying that. Yeah. Story is a story. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. <clears throat> the fact that there's molten rock everywhere. Uh, and as you said, uh, oodles of elemental fire. Yes. Um, I think is the appeal there. So before we get into a whole lot other, why would anybody send their party there, Josh? Why would anybody send their adventuring group as a game master, send their adventuring group there? Or why would any adventuring group want to go there? Elemental fire. It is probably the number one place in bar save to harvest true fire mm -hmm. which is a useful and valuable commodity useful in enchanting yeah true elements of any sort are important and valuable in enchanting true fire mm -hmm. is one of the components that is used to power the fire cannons used on to scrang river boats as well as airships uh, so it is yeah. in in demand as a result of that mm -hmm. so that that would be no. One notable adventure hook. Yeah. Why groups might want to go there, even if they're not necessarily interested in gathering those things themselves. There are plenty of Somebody. folks that are. And when a mining ship goes missing or an expedition or something happens and uh, danger is suspected, then the player characters are apt to be hired to go and look into it. <laughs> Yeah, because you can't just, you know, go get animal fire and walk out of there. You actually have to have an orocalcum container to fit that in, yeah. or it's going to burn its way through the hull of or clothing or whatever you've got for protective gear. It just isn't going to work. So, And yeah. then in addition to the true fire, there are plenty of creatures that are unique to that environment. Mm -hmm. And so their bits and pieces might also be useful in terms of enchanting or something in a ritual that might be needed. Elemental spirits are also fire spirits are, are also fairly common there uh, and certainly yeah. likely to be powerful ones because of the connection that's there. And so if your elementalist is looking to gather information or, or anyone is, is looking to gather information that might be known by a fire spirit, having them in mm -hmm. that area is another potential hook. And it's also just an interesting and dangerous terrain where the conditions themselves are going to pose an obstacle to the player character group. Even if you're dealing with a higher circle group, when you have yeah. a hazardous environment like that, it's similar to the Badlands or the Wastes or the Mist Swamps. Mm -hmm. where oh, we'll get there in a minute <laughs> yeah we'll 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 talk about those eventually we'll get there in a minute yes but 
at that point, you're looking at an exploration at a at survival themes, mm-hmm. groups that might need to be a little bit more careful with their the logistics of their expedition or having magic like scouts, uh, wilderness survival talent um, available not only to them, but to Beastmasters and some other disciplines as well. Yeah. Knowledge skills. Death's Sea is a dangerous and hazardous area. And because of the danger that it presents, there were some folks who tried to use that to protect themselves during the scourge. So there could be in the vicinity of Death Sea near its shores, cares or Mm -hmm. forgotten layers of magicians, elementalists most commonly, but perhaps any magician that might be looking for a an isolated place to perform their experiments where people wouldn't be likely to come across them. Yeah. The third book in the Jerol trilogy, Poison Poisoned Memories. Memories, I think, has a bit where there's an island in Death's yes. Sea that is a a place where some stuff happens. And so it's even setting aside the elemental wealth and hazards that are present there it's an exotic and interesting yeah. location. I remember in one of the Earth Dawn journals, there was actually a adventure written that takes the player characters near the Death Sea, not exactly over it or onto it. They didn't have to go there by airship, but it was very, very close. They had to suffer the effects of heat and dehydration. And don't remember what the name of that one was called, uh, but it introduced a whole separate like tribe of people that had never been explored before um, throughout the rest of Earth Dawn material. So that's in one of the Earth Dawn journals. But I, I remember running my party through that one as well. So I think it was in issue. I want to say two. That was like my favorite issue of all the nine. Sounds so. right. It's the one that I don't have. A physical copy ah, of eBay. I have all the physical copies. Uh, anyway, so onto death. So yeah, Death Sea. Oddly enough, um, because it is a lot of molten rock, there actually the entire amount of it causes a glow because of course it's burning hot, and so the shore of the of the Death Sea, as I said, is you know, mostly black stone hills and, and very tall cliffs. Right, just north west of that are the Twilight Peaks. This glow from Death Sea is what gives the Twilight Peaks their glow. And so that's how the Twilight Peaks got their name, that they're constantly at twilight, whether the sun is up or the sun is down, because the molten magma there is red and orange, and true fire is, of course, very white and very sparkly. So you can find it uh, that way to do so. But if you are going to go mining there at all, yeah, read up on on a fire miner's advice on how to do that. So basically, you're down there in a loincloth and some protective boots and some protective gloves to mine this stuff, and you're jumping onto what they call a fool's island, which, if you don't respect it, you're going to die real quick because they disappear. They <laughs> they bubble up, and disappear really, really quickly. Yeah, the the most basic form of fire mining involves sailing your barge protected by magics from the heat tossing elemental air off of the side of the the ship down into the lava to cause an explosion that will bring kernels of true fire to the surface and then sending somebody down to gather it up as quickly Mm -hmm. as possible and hopefully not get eaten by nasty critters that may be drawn to the activity of what's going on and you've got Magma beasts and firebirds. Viras, is that the name of the, the creatures? I want to say that they and are. And then firebirds and fire Yeah, eagles. fire wraiths, firebirds, fireworms, magma beasts, lava fish, salamanders, anything heat based you're going to find there. And there's more than half a dozen. I just don't have all of them off the top of my head. And they are all <laughs> nasty. <laughs> tough, nasty. You're. Novice player characters are not going to do well. Against yeah, no, I have a character uh, who plays in my campaign when I get a chance to run it, who is an absolute pyromaniac. And his favorite quote is, when I make it rain, things burn. So every once in a while, I throw them close to the Death Sea. That way I'm like, you have to think outside your own little box of just making everything burn. So because go ahead and hit a firebird with fire spells. It tickles. So uh, there's that. So moving just a little bit northward out of the Death Sea, there is what is called Dead Man's Gullet. 
uh, north to the Scarlet Sea, because the Scarlet Sea is also just a little bit smaller than Death Sea. Uh, what about a quarter of the size? And it's also, you know, magma <laughs> uh, and hot as Hades, because the Serpent River flows over the Scarlet's northern edge, uh, creating the mist swamps and making the heavy rains of the mist swamps. But the there's an island really in between Scarlet Sea and Death Sea, which is known as Mount Bloodfire, and it is a volcano. Volcano. And has many, many honeycombed caves in there, ripe for exploring to your detriment, to your fortune. We talked about, actually, back in the, the Riverboat episode, about the yes. Scadians and their kingdom, their former kingdom, back before the Scourge, was on the shores of yes. Death's Sea. Uh, and so a lot of the ruins of that culture, that civilization, that nation could be found along the northern shores around the Scarlet Sea and, and in the what would be sort of the eastern foothills of the mm -hmm. Twilight Peaks. So um, two wonderful areas to explore. So the Scarlet Sea is actually better for fire mining. It's not as rich in elemental fire, but it's a little bit safer. It's not quite not quite as hot. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit smaller, not quite as dangerous from a denizen perspective. Uh, inhabitant <laughs> point of view. So it, it is yeah. a little bit safer, but you are not going to get quite the wealth of true elemental fire out of it that you would from Death's yeah. Sea itself. So it's a trade-off. <laughs> Go maybe a little bit safer and not strike it quite as rich or risk more for a greater potential yeah. payoff. Now, the other thing, and this wasn't really revealed until later when we get into talking about sort of first edition yes. release schedule when we get into the Skypoint and Vivain mm -hmm. box set, where it's revealed that once you get sort of outside of Bar Save, once you get kind of into the southern area of the Death's Sea map, yeah. map the southern reaches are actually water, that there is kind of a... There's a meeting point. Coastline, there's a barrier, there's a meeting place mm -hmm. between the lava flows of Death's Sea and what would be, because again, if we're talking about bar save as correlations with mm -hmm. ancient earth, Death's Sea is what is the present day yeah. Black Sea. And so there's that Southern stretch of it. And it's not ever really been talked about. I have not looked at the Skypoint box in a while, but I don't think it's actually really yeah. mentioned there. What the barrier zone between the lava flows and the water is. I think there's a river in that sort of Vivain province, far southwestern Barsave area yeah. that actually flows down into the actual water part of Death's Sea. But then it sort of continues down from there. And obviously, much like the Black Sea flows into the mm -hmm. Mediterranean, the watery portion of Death's Sea flows into uh, the Celestrian Sea, which is the basin where island of Great yeah. Theron So is. that's a little teaser for when we actually get to talk about the geography of Skypoint and Vivain and the changes in 4th edition. So uh, otherwise, so yeah, the Mount Bloodfire Volcano is rather a large island. Many things can take place there. So if you're going to have your adventuring party maybe do a stopover, that's the safest place it looks like. Even though, you know, it's an active volcano, take your chances. <laughs> relatively <laughs> relatively yeah. speaking uh, safe as a matter exactly. of degrees uh, so there is reportedly a inhabitant of the uh, mist swamps because if you just go a little bit north east of the Scarlet Sea there's this little uh, point there where the Serpent River and the Scarlet Sea kind of meet up and that of course makes the mist swamps because of course all that hot lava and all the cold water phew, you get mist uh, the Mist Swamps are the domain of the Great Dragon yes. Aban. That's the denizen I was speaking of. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Reportedly, the Mist Swamps are also very dangerous as well in, a, mm -hmm. in their own way. The Swamps are also rumored to be where the Castle of Assassins... You, I was just going to bring that up and see if you could expand on that a little further. So, The Castle of Assassins are one branch of... Oh, no, now I'm feeling the pressure. It's not the Keys of Death. It's the other nasty cult. I don't have that. I prepped, and Josh did not, and his memory is still kicking my ass. Societies. The Hand of Corruption. Yes. 
Thank you. I just found it at the same time you did. Because <laughs> the Castle of Assassins... Supposedly the Castle of Assassins, which is one of the branches of the mm-hmm. Hand of Corruption. Uh, the Hand of Corruption being basically another sinister cult that are basically dedicated to the idea that the world is irrevocably corrupt. We're going to have to do an entire episode on just the cults in Earth Dawn. That just... <laughs> we'll get into the weeds on those later. Uh, but yes... There are some similarities between them and the and the Keys of Death, but they are different organizations with yeah. different goals, and I don't know them well enough off the top of my head. Me neither. To go I gotta look them right up. Uh, we'll pencil that in for a later prep. episode. Uh, according to the tales, the dark towers and walls are cut from the black stone of the mountains and adorned with leering gargoyles that also act as guardians. Uh, though some travelers claim to have seen the castle, none have apparently drawn close enough to get a good look at it, or if they have, they have not returned to share that tale. So... Some speculate that the Castle of Assassins being in the Mist Swamps is an indication that they are supported to some degree by Mm -hmm. Aban because she would not brook the presence of those who she does not welcome into her domain. So uh, right there, the truth of such rumors (laughs) is up to you, the Game Master. So between Death Sea, uh, Mount yeah, Mount Bloodfire, the Scarlet Sea, and the Mist Swamps. There's just four really dangerous areas right then and there you can kind of lace throughout your parties um, and with their appetite to maybe go there, find something there. And then through there, we're not really going to talk there. about it now because we talked about it a little yeah. bit already. You've also got the I Badlands. I was just going to say that's kind of just, just a little bit because uh, of what I finally came across is just the description thereof reminds me of the scene in Star Wars where the where R2-D2 is just traveling by himself and the Jawas come across him. And so that rocky terrain, that desolate area, but it's still got some canyons. It's got a whole bunch of just rocks and pebbles all over the place. So it's not a smooth traveling surface. That's what the Badlands looks like. Because I'm always trying to give visuals to my players so they can have this movie in their mind about what things look like as they're traveling through it. So yeah, that's, that's the Badlands. So right there... <laughs> that whole southwestern corner yeah. of Bar Save yes. is between the Badlands and the Mist Swamps and Death's Sea, mm-hmm. and the Twilight Peaks comparatively are a little bit more hospitable, but still populated by the yeah. Sky Raiders, the Crystal mm-hmm. Raiders, and the couple of moots up there that are bloodthirsty yeah. killers. So yeah, between the trolls, between the trolls of the Twilight Peaks, the fire mining in the Death Sea, the dragon in the Mist Swamps, <laughs> and Death Sea actually factors a little bit into the history of Carafad and oh, Landis, one of the big climactic battles of the Orichalcum Wars. The the conflicts between Carafad yeah. and Landis revolves around fighting over the portion of. Death's Sea that is kind of on the shared border of Mm -hmm. those areas and somebody unleashed a whole bunch of fire elementals and and killed a whole bunch of people. Yes. Yeah, there's there's a lot of cool stuff kind of tied up there. And if you want a little bit of an unusual or exotic environment to set your adventures in. Or near. (laughs) That's a pretty cool place to look. And you've got a lot of unique kind of creatures and... The dangers, because at that point, you're near the Crystal Raider yeah. territory. You've got the Great Dragon, the Ban, and you got to be careful maybe about treading too close to her area. Well, all kinds of And then all there's kinds one draw we didn't even mention, which is the Lost City. Oh, yeah. That's another thing that is rumored to be within the Mist Swamps, very likely to be where a Ban herself makes yeah. her lair, uh, is within the Lost City of Irns mm-hmm. Morgath. Just a cool name which is supposedly a city from long, long Way ago. pre-scourge. The previous, like not even, we're not even talking pre-scourge. We're talking about previous yes. age of magic Way kind old. of thing. And who knows what kind of secrets and treasures and such can be yeah. found I'm there. just the kind of game master that, yes, that's where I would put a band to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's her lair. Stay in there. But that's just me. So I figured we, we could hit a, a few more geography topics on a couple of the upcoming podcasts. And so I wanted to start with Death Sea because it was uh, brief and would fit into exactly a half of a podcast with email coming up uh, at the beginning of it. So um, 
If you have any ideas, I actually tell you what, if you have any adventures you've actually run through the Death Sea, the Scarlet Sea, the Mist Swamps, or the Badlands, send them to us. Josh and I would love to read them. Uh, if you want to write on air, we can do that as well. But otherwise, we just love to read them, period. So I want to see what everyone, everyone's creativity has been within and around the Death Sea in that whole, like Josh said, the bottom corner of bar save there. But otherwise, folks, um, any final thoughts on anything we talked about today, Josh? No, I think we covered everything pretty well. I don't see any reason to belabor the <laughs> point anymore. No, Death Sea's pretty cool. It was a nice little... Um, wrinkle in the just uh terrain of, of where, you, where you could go in bar save because we had rivers and land this is a river of land so otherwise folks uh we will see you next time or you'll hear us next time at the very least so until then uh it's time for you to go explore your own legend good night everybody <laughs>